Uh, to a degree, yes. Uh, it should be I would double check on the, on the structure on the actual the video slide, but they, these are all within one to three years old. Against two to three years old. We were doing, whenever we do inspections anywhere, and it looks all nice. nice and, uh, we try to do what's called downtown water problem with those plants and doesn't want to cut these plants out. But are we on, Gary? Uh, yep. Cut away all these bushes. I do see uh, some rust. I do see more paint and rust. Still. Well, I'll just make a so block and we'll install the introduction. Uh, but basically, what you're looking at, at well, it's uh, free online under our Firescape Academy, Academy YouTube channel. channel. It's called Firescape Academy. First off, YouTube. I see that the uh, Watch us at home. The square head bolts. Uh, uh, you can forward any one of these videos to your guys. We have playlists from different areas. So who sees? We took all the this uh, thing around. Around. So usually two to five minutes long to each. Seven, five years. So and these are just a random bolt. So nobody so called me about this. So we just walk in the alleyways and we saw yeah, something and said, "Let's make us a class." Um, so and we use that just to teach uh, uh, your fire uh, inspectors uh, how to uh, like look at fire without having to but physically get on them and hurt yourself. We did a lot of these fire escapes are, are hand grenades with the bridge pulled out. And, was the and all the only thing you need to do is just give it a slight kick and this thing is ready to, to hurt somebody. So I do see a lot of rust. Not a lot, but a good amount of surface rust. So I definitely So a lot of these uh, a lot of these videos are uh, probably two, three years old. Some of the best videos that you'll see now is actually classes where I walk around with this and do one on one, -one training. Uh, I walk around with building commissioners to do one-on-one -on -one training. And that's the one you kind of want to see. Away. I should to see here. So I'll, uh, I'll forward a couple of bits up to let you walk to come on down. And stuff, and we definitely don't want that.
these, uh, any engineer inspecting this would definitely condemn this box and this the majority of this firescape has structural issues throughout. As always, you can always get some additional information from us. Free Firescape Awareness Program we can do for your city. That includes industry standard confidence tests, tags, uh, load test criteria, as well as repair procedure criteria. Firescape Academy inspector training video. You ready? Here's a rare case, an all aluminum replacement fire. I think you guys already know why you're here. I'm going to have to go through a lot of formalities. <laughs> Welcome. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for coming out. Appreciate it very much. Um, Cisco here is uh, going to talk to you about um, fire escape, safety, fire escape, inspections, etc. Um, I briefed him this morning on the fact that New Hampshire is a little bit different than a lot of states whereby State of New Hampshire has Life Safety Code 101, which is their overarching safety code that they use, but each individual jurisdiction may have different codes, building codes, different enforcement procedures, etc., inspection procedures. Um, so he's got a little bit of a challenge in front of him today. Um, hopefully you guys can get some information on um, fire escape safety, um, inspection procedures, etc., that you can take back to your communities and either enhance what you're doing already or share some of the information that you have and maybe build a pro program that you don't have in place currently. This is something new that we're doing here. Um, this is the first time Cisco's been up here uh, and this is the first time we've hosted a seminar like this. So I'm grateful to see you guys here. We were hoping for a little bit of a larger turnout, but situations being what they are, etc., we fully understand that. What I would ask though is if you get some good information out of this, they spread it around that this information is out there, and I'm sure that, that we can work with Cisco to come back and do this again if need be. Uh, if the need is there, which is definitely something we can come back and do again. Um, <clears throat> that all being said, I'm going to turn it over to Cisco in a second, but I just got to do my regular fire academy routine of all of the procedures and policies and everything else that we have. <clears throat> if you guys need to have something to drink, you can go ahead and do it. You can bring it in here. We used to have rules where you didn't have anything to drink in the classrooms. So you now can that. We have all this brand new carpet, so feel free. Just don't spill anything on it. It's still get cranky. However, you can eat, drink, etc. in the classrooms again. Um, ladies' rooms and restrooms, uh, men's room, right out in the hallway. You probably already know where they are. They're right out here by the lobby. If the fire alarm does go off, it is not a drill. Please exit the building. Follow the exit signs. You guys can determine whatever you want to do as far as your assembly location outside, but your best bet is probably just go right back out the front door. Um, has everybody filled out one of the uh, application forms this morning? Okay, that again is a new policy, and I, I probably explained it, and you already know because we talked about it a little bit beforehand. But when we have seminars and workshops that the, the, the Academy is hosting, we're not going to be doing pre registrations unless it's required for the presenter where they need to develop the appropriate amount of materials. So if we don't do pre registrations, the registration forms will be here uh, for you to fill out when you get here. So everybody needs to fill one of those things out. This is a craft program and it will be on your transcript here at the Academy. So that's all I have to say about that. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Cisco. Have a great time. Learn a whole bunch of stuff. And again, if you get some good solid information out of this, which I really hope you will, um, take it back to your jurisdictions, talk it up amongst your friends, talk it up amongst your colleagues. And if there's something that you want us to bring back again, let us know. Deal directly with Cisco if you want or contact me. We'll be in contact with each other again, and uh, we'll bring it back. How's that sound? Cool. All right, Cisco, thank you very much. Take care, have a good time. As I mentioned before, to some of you who've heard, I'm going to put on a couple of pieces of uh, video. That's the rest of it that I'm going to be speaking with you, then I'm going to open it up. It's back and forth. Um, the most important part of here is that what you are about to hear here is a problem that's a nationwide problem. This is not just a New Hampshire problem. This is a Massachusetts problem, a Washington, D.C. problem. A Chicago problem, a Texas problem, a Seattle problem, and an LA problem. So as we play some of these videos, we're going to show you uh, and train you, and we're going to talk about industry standard documentation, which we have here. And I'm going to cover all these pieces. And from this, we're going to create a book for you that basically has a CD of this class. So this class is getting recorded. But there's many other classes 
that we've had uh, 100, 200 people in there that we also recorded. So you don't have to just watch this class. You can watch any class and it's all online. We have to be on Firescape Academy under YouTube. Just that's all you have to type in, Firescape Academy. And you can watch Seattle seminars, Portland seminars, uh, watch various inspectors and people walking the streets with me and looking at Firescapes, okay? So with that being said, let me see if I can play you this first one. And this is a fireman's worst nightmare uh, when it comes to the second means of egress. Because when you show up at a fire, you're supposed to be doing what to the fire? Fighting the fire, right? You don't go to fires to do rescue missions, do you? So, but whenever you have fire escapes that are not uh, properly maintained, not working correctly, you get there and you have a problem with the fire escape, is it a you fighting a fire or are you doing a rescue mission? So, this just happened uh, not a month ago. But right now, firefighters are taking down the lines and rolling up the hoses. But earlier in the night, when they pulled up, there were flames coming out of the side of the building. Firefighters say it was one of the scarier moments because when you pull up to a building and you see children, and mothers hanging out the side of the fire escape, smoke swirling around them. Isn't that scary, scary stuff? They got up there, they got the ladders up, and they said nobody got hurt. The uh, fire escape, there was uh, three or four people hanging off the fire escape. They couldn't get off. They were just on the fire escapes. I had people hanging in the fire escapes at the rear of the building, and on this side of the building, they, we had a bunch of people on that fire escape. Well, about 50 people were displaced inside this building. Our fire fire escape, there's good news tonight. It looks like everybody will be allowed to go back in, except the one unit where the fire was in. They said, that's good luck to them tonight. I'm Bob Wilson, on the scene of Bridgeport, News 8. All right, the next one I'm gonna show you is a Channel 7 news piece with good old Hank Philby Ryan. But before I get to Hank Philby Ryan, what do you think about that? It's only a 50 second piece that says what happened in Bridgeport, which as you guys know, that next day, I believe, they lost some firefighters. Not on this particular situation, they lost some firefighters. And then I think Stanford, uh, Stanford, Stanford, uh, lost some uh, firefighters uh, on, on another project, on another fire. But get into a fire and all of a sudden, here you are, the first thing you're concerned about, that, that was a great shot of an eight-year-old child on a fire escape. And what does he mean, stuck on a fire escape? How can you get stuck on a fire escape? The only way you get stuck on a fire escape is that the ladder didn't come down or the can leave didn't come down. Because you're supposed to self-evacuate off a of fire escape. They're made for self-evacuation. They're there for the tenants only, for them to get out of that building, away from the fire, and when you guys show up a minute, an hour later, it doesn't matter. They've self-evacuated. Because that was the answer back when, when you only needed one means of egress inside and a second means of egress outside. Now you don't, they stopped that in 1930. Now every building in the country is built with two. Okay, but some of these older buildings that were supposed to be gone by now are duct tape, paper clipped, and held together with bubble gum, and guess what also got stuck on the back and stayed? Now when they've evacuated and they've gone away, guess who shows up and uses it? Because now what, what are these firemen doing to get these people off the fire escape? Jumping on the very same fire escape? Are they wasting time getting ladders? So right now there's a blazing fire on one apartment going at it. And can they focus on that at all? So you might, you might lose the building with the minutes that go roll on by as you're just taking these people gingerly off this fire escape. And in some of your volunteer forces, you don't got a lot of people to, 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 to deal with. So you, you're turning into a rescue mission to get these people off just so you can let the building burn to the ground. Because once it gets hold and it, it gets out of your control, you gotta step back, you gotta surround and drown. So that's what happened here. But then also at the end, I said, hey, they got everybody off. So it became a rescue mission. Not, not anything else, and then the fire by itself stayed in one apartment. And it's a 50 apartment building. So this is what we're trying to talk about fire escapes. Now, you guys remember the Station Night Fire? Right after that, uh, Hank Philbin Ryan called around, and she happened to call us. So she didn't call us specifically, she called around looking, said, listen, I want to do a story on fire escapes and tell people that in case of fire, you can get out the second means of egress because of this horrible accident that happened in, uh, in uh, Rhode Island. I told her that I've been inspecting for so many years that 75% uh, or more of the fire schemes I inspect, including some of the major institutions in Boston, fail inspection. She goes, that's impossible. You know, you have laws there that say you must inspect them every five years, it's in the codes, you know, we got inspectors, we got fire, you know, fire inspectors, we got everybody. That's impossible. I says, well, why don't you come down with me, and I'll take it out to the theater district down uh, by uh, uh, where the Wang Theater is. And all I did was basically gave her a 15 minute training. Training of, here's a blown out gusset. 
Here's a broken tread. Here's blown out cement. Big, heavy, in your face kind of problems. Not the, oh, can you see the fine line of rust? No, no, nothing like that. And then after that, she says, you know, okay, take me around and let's look at Farscape. I says, no, no, walk any way you want. You tell me if any of the Farscapes you inspect now pass. And she walked the theater district, and she failed every Farscape that was there. Then she said, took it upon herself to go into the Beacon Hill and around the area to various communities by herself and her crew, obviously. And this is the piece that she came out with. It was supposed to be a one minute piece saying, if you got Farscapes that are available to you, um, this is what she came out with. and a firefighter's line of duty. But Chief William Hitchcock remembers the night it wasn't the fire that almost stopped him. Of course, escaped to death. <laughs> but the fire escaped that broke underneath him. Where well, the railing just came away from the building. And our investigation found across Massachusetts, more unsafe fire escapes. Rusty, deteriorating, crumbling, broken. And what state officials didn't know, the system they set up to keep fire escapes safe is also falling apart. The potential ramifications are disastrous. So let's look at this one. This expert iron worker is licensed to build, maintain, and inspect fire escapes. For months, we examined dozens of them with alarming results. Looking at this today, would this pass inspection? No. In dormitories, at theaters, at homes, and apartment buildings. Rust is actually eating away the metal of the right. fire escape. Right. And the bottom line? They'll get weak and then guys will fall. This one has rotted connections. This one, missing molds, twisted metal. Would the stairs come down? No, no, not. This one, a broken tread. So how dangerous is it for the people inside this building? This fire escape is definitely going to put somebody either in the hospital or it's going to put somebody in a, in a cemetery. Fire escapes are so critical. The state building code requires they be certified for structural adequacy and safety every five years. But our investigation found that safeguard is simply being ignored. Here's proof. We chose fire escapes at random in Boston, Somerville, Cambridge, Worcester, and here in Quincy. We checked building department files. But there's no fire escape certification. To see if building owners had submitted their mandatory inspection reports. There's no certification in this one Bottom line, not one we checked in Quincy had been certified as safe. And the director of inspectional services admitted because of staffing shortages, the city has no idea how many other fire escape owners are breaking the rules. And as a result, do you know how many fire escapes in your city are safe or not? Well, I don't know. In Worcester, not one we checked was certified. In Somerville, no. four more fire escapes. Did it fall through the cracks? Yeah. Not one up-to-date certification. And again, no system for keeping track. Uh, how can they get away with that? We, I guess that the shortest answer of all is because we don't have the resources to sit here and follow up on these things. If structural deficiencies are reported, local building inspectors can actually evacuate residents until repairs are made. Would you talk to us on camera about this? No. But when we surveyed two dozen more communities, most admitted they had no idea how many fire escapes were certified. In Taunton, inspectors told us they haven't seen a certification in 25 years. Northampton officials said, it's a cold day in hell when that happens. In Cambridge, too, not one of our test buildings was certified, and the official in charge would not come out to discuss it. In Boston, where there are more than 8,000 fire escapes, again, according to inspectional services, not one we checked was certified. Officials know they are required to enforce the building code, but they admit they don't always know if owners are breaking the law. The building code is being ignored. Right, but it's difficult to write a violation you don't have knowledge of something like that. But state officials say for a critical issue like this, communities should know. And they warn, the Massachusetts building code is not optional. Does it worry you that these fire escapes are not being certified? This is an important issue and should not be ignored. That's because after the smoke and flames begin, it'll be too late to learn. You've got no way out. I can't stress it enough, Hank, that these things have to be maintained and, and someone's got to be watching. As a result of our investigation, state officials will now issue an alert to local inspectors. Meanwhile, if there's a fire escape on your home or office, you can contact your local building department to make sure it's properly certified. In the newsroom, I'm Hank Ellaby Ryan. So, let me uh, now set this thing up so that 
she didn't believe uh, you know, the information that we had given her, and all of a sudden she went out and proved it. This is the Farscape Academy, and as you can see, we have probably uh, 550 videos, and these are all the previous seminars we've done, uh, walk arounds, so I'll share with some of those with you in a little bit, okay? But now let's get into the class, and let's talk about that video and what came from that. Um, you know, what are some of the things you can do? Um, in regards to the immediate aftermath. That was done, uh, does anybody remember the Station Knife Park? Was it 2003, 2004? 2003. We did this in 2003. Eight years later. Guess what kind of Farscape reform there has been? None. So, we've, uh, actually we go back one. Um, The immediate the aftermath of that is, which started helping a little bit, is immediately uh, in the city of Boston, because the building department is the one that controls the inspections, not the fire department. In the all 50 states, all 40 states, the fire department takes over. After the building department builds it, the fire department takes over and watches it for the, for the lifetime of the building. In 40 states. In some states, it's the building department that not only builds it, but then they also have some inspection routine going on. Elevators, uh, uh, sprinklers and such and such and such. It's not the fire department. It's actually all on top of the building department for 10 states. Massachusetts being one of those states where the building department is the one I answer to when it comes to inspecting the fire escape. And they have an affidavit and they have a certification process. Okay. And we're teaching a class, as a matter of fact, uh, on the 26th of this month down in Reading, Mass. If any of you want to send some of your building department guys, that's a class that actually the, uh, the Association of Building Inspectors that Boston belongs to is going to be in that class. So that's a pretty big, uh, pretty big class we're gonna have. So the first thing that they did, let me give you some tricks right off the bat. And I mentioned this to a couple of you guys here because um, I, I did a brief interview with Scotty and uh, what's the other gentleman? Yeah. Ken. And um, they made it so that you pull any permit in your city, you cannot close a permit unless you have a current affidavit. So you wanna work with your subcode official or your building department, you make them say, you get any building, that any permit that gets pulled, Issue the permit. Do not close any permit if there's a fire escape. If the second means of egress is identified to be outside, you cannot close that permit. So you're going to start automatically picking up permits, I mean, picking up certificates on buildings that people are spending money on, trading them, selling them, doing something. So you can't close the permit until, so somebody does a bathroom, does a roof, does a porch, all of a sudden now you've got this trigger that says, do you have a second means of egress and is it outside? Yes. I need a certificate in order to close your permit. Number two, how many uh, in order to occupy an apartment or to uh, to get a uh, an occupancy permit? What do you need? Who's the last guy walking in? Checking the smokes. You make it a checklist. You add it to your checklist because if the smoke goes off, the smoke uh, most, uh, most smoke detectors go off at night or in the daytime. And if you're at night, are you in your kitchen or are you in your bedroom? And if you're in your bedroom, where are you going to jump to? The front stairs or are you going to jump to the fire escape that's right outside your window? So somehow, some way, tie in a request that when you do your final walkthrough, you're issuing a certificate, okay, for the smoke detectors, you ask for a copy of, you're not ordering a fire escape inspection. You're asking for a copy of the last fire escape inspection that they've done. So you can attach it to your, to your paperwork. And if they say, I don't have one, what do you say? Yeah. Get one. And it's your choice. Either issue the, the certificate to them for the smokes, because sometimes people make noise about that. But they've already got a violation that's on it. And now, even though you hand them the certificate, can they occupy the building if they don't have a smoke, if they have a fire escape that's suspect? So, you know, if they say, no, I don't have one, and I don't even know who's supposed to get one, you can now choose. You can give it a quick eyeball from the ground. I'm going to teach you how to look at fire escapes and say, if you get this done within seven days, I'll let you occupy by the end of the month. You don't get it done. You don't get this process started. You know, here's your smokes, but you're not getting in this building anyway. I won't let you. It's a great concept, but it's never going to happen. What's the cost of, a, uh, of an inspection from you guys? Great question. Not just us guys. Let's, oh, let's talk about who can inspect. Who can fire escape engineers. Yeah which are people that have licenses of some sort that can, they can inspect fire escape, and structural engineers. Right. You know any structural engineers in your area? 
Most structural engineers will charge you anywhere from 75 to 175 plus, depending if you want some really high-end guy. But on average, one, uh, 75 to uh, 175 an hour for uh, for an inspection. They usually want to get anywhere from three to five hours, including travel time and report generation, uh, it, but no more than 10. So if you get a guy that's on average of 500, I mean, of uh, 150 bucks as an example per hour, and he's got either if he's got 10 hours. He's going to get fifteen hundred bucks from that inspection. He's got it for five hours. He's got a seven hundred fifty dollar inspection. On average, the 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 inspection rates that we have for typical inspections is one eighty nine to four hundred eighty nine for typical residential. Commercial applications go run from four eighty nine to nine eighty nine. But we're not the only ones that can do it. Structural engineers, seventy five bucks, one hundred seventy five bucks, and some of them start the clock only when they arrive. They can give you some documentation. We'll tell you what kind of documentation you should expect from these people, because you don't want these one, uh, one uh, type letter uh, uh, forms that they send out that says to my, you know, the Farscape has some rust, some expansion, some deflection. It means that you want photographs. We'll show you what that's all about. So um, let me see if there's any other tricks that they they have uh, for you. And you mentioned that it's never going to happen. Why? Uh, there's no, there's no possible way for a city. National to have money to ensure that the, the fire or building inspectors are on top. You need more than one full time person just to do fire escape. Right, no, what I'm, you're, you are correct. And in many cities, they used to have lots, and now with all the costs and reductions, you have one and a half. <laughs> right. You know, but this is a, this all this is is just a trick. And it's, it's getting it on a list. As soon as you get it on a list that says, I pulled a permit, somebody at the permit process saying, has added to the checklist, you know, I just came in for a change of toilet, and all of a sudden I'm ready to close my permit, and at the very bottom it says, is your means of egress inside or outside? It's a checklist item. It just reminds the guy who's ever on the checklist of uh, the building department say, oh, uh, before I can close this, is you have an inside stair or an outside stair? Outside stair, okay, in order for me to close this, I just need, um, I need a copy of your current certificate. Do you have one? No, All right, go get me one, then I can close this permit. But you, your inspector already went there and checked the toilet, everything's fine, but now this is a pending file. Then you also have these occupancy issues where you guys do walk in and check the smokes. And you say, okay, I need to check the smokes, okay, do you have inside or outside things? So it's nothing but a checklist item. This should be a full-time activity for somebody, but until then, these checklist items just helps keep it as an awareness, meaning it, you're using uh, the same way with sprinklers we talked about. If you accept sprinkler forms, you modify your sprinkler form to say, do you have an internal or external means of egress? External, great. With every sprinkler form, because it's already part of your sprinkler form, it says, if your egress is uh, external, you must, with the sprinkler form every year, you must submit a current Firescape affidavit. Because the sprinklers go off, I'm heading to a main stair. If it's not blocked, or I'm heading to the fire escape. So there it is, yes. What says they have to do that? You say you have to do it. There's a couple things that you have to do. One is, and I, I got around this. I know. I, I, here's, how it, here's how it works. Nationwide, I get the same problem, ready? Uh, you can do an ordinance to the city. You can do, um, through the fire code, you can create some sort of administrative rule. But here's the best one that I got out of a state official in Massachusetts. He goes, you don't need to do any of that stuff. You just need to create what's called a policy. And if you create this form that says your policy is that you follow some sort of national <coughs> guideline that says all fire escapes will have tag, all fire escapes will have confidence tests, all fire escapes will be inspected every five years. You're not creating code. You're basically saying you're trying to follow a policy and that this is the policy and guidelines that you're <coughs> following to the best of your ability. So. They have nationwide, in, for example, Seattle, they didn't have any fire escape code, so they made an administrative rule change, and that takes one to three years to do that. Some say, you know, no, I'm just gonna go to my local councilman and we're gonna get the, you know, the, a meeting of the, of the city councilman and just basically say, we wanna have an ordinance in this city that says all fire escapes must have a confidence test and a um, certificate on file every five years. Boom, there it is. But then policy, you guys write policies all the time, right? Don't you have a policy? Uh, and, and guideline books that you guys sort of create for for sheds and for you know different things that pop up wood stoves and stuff, <coughs> this little policy thing uh, we we have that policy that we've written out in a document that we can provide to you we put your name and number on the top and have all the information there and it's a policy guidelines for how you inspect it policy guidelines how to repair it and policy guidelines on how you paint it 
So whenever you get a question that someone says, well, how do you want me to inspect? You say, well, follow these guidelines, more or less. Because of this lack of knowledge, we've also started the National Firescape Association.org. And a lot of these videos are there. A lot of the industry standard documentation is there. It's already up online. National Firescape Association.org. And what that is, that it's memberships. We're looking at the launching is fully in April of this year. Its members is firefighters, building inspectors, 